Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola. I'm here on behalf of the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we look into careers in peace building talk story series. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn about exploring the journey into the profession. Today's event is about building capacities for social renewal with Gregory John Stock and Dr. Maya Satoro. Uh, today's event um, will be focused on learning about uh, Mr. Stock, who will discuss how his current work has been informed and inspired as an alumni right here of our grad certificate in conflict resolution at the Matsunaga Institute. As a high school instructor, Greg enjoys incorporating conflict resolution practices and modalities such as medic mediation, negotiation, and facilitation into his classes. Greg currently teaches information ecology, international relations, and social studies at the Green School in Bali, Indonesia. The Green School mission is to create a global community of learners, making our world sustainable. The school enrolls both local and international students. Um, the Green School's mission is to create a global community of learners, um, making our world sustainable. From uh, the origins of the Green School Bali uh, had become global movement in education with schools opening also in New Zealand, South Africa, and Tulum. Uh, our living their living curriculum educates uh, for sustainability through community integrated entrepreneurial learning and in a natural environment. They strive as a champion of new model of education that nurtures the whole child, giving them agency in their own lives and learning so that they can thrive with purpose in ever changing world. So we definitely uh, thank you all for being here today. A um, little bio about our speakers. Uh, Greg's academic background is from the University of Hawaii at Manila, which includes a grad certificate in Southeast Asian studies. Indonesian language, conflict resolution, right here from the Mount Sinai Institute, and a graduate degree in both Asian studies and library and information sciences. He taught in the Honolulu Waldorf High School from 2000 to 2016. Uh, Greg's hobbies and interests include surfing, gamelan music, and biodynamic uh, agriculture. And then our other uh, moderator for today will be uh, Dr. Maya Satoro. Dr. Satoro serves as a consultant at, for the Obama Foundation, working closely with their international team, developing programming in the Pacific Asia region. Prior to her work with the Obama Foundation, she was director of the Mount Sinai Institute in Conflict Resolution at the University of Hawaii. Uh, she currently serves as the graduate chair right now for the office. Um, where in addition to leading outreach and development initiatives, she also taught leadership for social change, history of peace movements, peace education, and conflict management for educators. Um, Dr. Zatoro is currently delayed a little bit, so I'm going to get the conversation started and then she'll uh, jump in shortly. But uh, thank you so much, Greg, for being with us today. I greatly appreciate you making time, especially with the different time zones. Um, you do not have a virtual background. Well, I do, and I'm so envious of your real background. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Um, We'll start uh, with a few questions. And as I stated earlier, uh, for anyone in the audience, if you do have any questions, please put it in the chat. If you're watching through the live stream, please put it uh, in, the, in the discussion portion of the video that's on the live stream. And I will be keeping track of all that as well. So uh, to get us started, uh, if you could just let us know a little bit about, like what has drawn you to Bali and Indonesia. Um, let's, let's start with that. Sure. Word. All right, Jose. Uh, fun question to play with because I, I really love both Bali and Indonesia. First discovered it about 20 years ago and uh, it was on that first trip that I met the family that uh, my wife and I now live with. So we live in a Balinese family compound. Really love the culture. I think many people if if they ask you know why are you drawn to Bali or Indonesia and they often say the people and I would say that for sure. People are very warm. Uh, the value relationships. Also, it's a beautiful island. The ocean is great. My wife and I are surfers and divers, so that's wonderful. We love the food, spicy food, abundant fruits and vegetables, and we both play gamelan music. So those are big reasons, but I think one thing I'd really like to highlight in Bali that I think many people notice right away are the prevalence of the arts. Arts are just so abundant here and so many people have skills in the arts. So you see wood carving, stone carving, uh, dance, puppetry, painting, um, even just the household offerings and, and the shrines, you know, part of the spiritual life. Art, art seems to be everywhere. And one of the ironic things I found out 
is that in the Balinese language, they don't have a word for art. They just sort of say it's, it's what we do. It's, uh, and we just do our best. But I think it's actually a form of, of worship and a form of balance. And you know, I come out of the Waldorf school movement and we incorporate the arts a lot. Um, what I see in Bali, they have this beautiful philosophy that I really resonate with. It's called Trihita Karana, and it's about balance. Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up from some Balinese friends. <laughs> uh, it's about paying attention to and striving for balance in our relationship with the spirit world, in our relationship with other human beings, and our in our relationship with nature. So we certainly discuss it here a lot at Green School, but I do think the arts are an incredible way to practice Trihita Karana. You know, we use natural elements when working with stone or wood or bamboo, and they're often made as offerings to the spirit world, but the arts are often done together too, whether it's the visual arts or practical arts. So uh, yeah, the arts are very prevalent here. I love that about Bali. And and I resonate with their deep recognition of, of spirituality, and I call it a grounded spirituality. It's not head in the clouds. I think they, through that balance, it, it's a very grounded, um, beautiful culture, and I'm honored to be a part of it. And it, it's nice living in a Balinese, with a Balinese family, I can be part of their ceremonies and, uh, and daily happenings. Thank you so much. I, I love that whole, um there is no concept for like no lit word for art and it's part of life and it really kind of provides a whole new uh perspective as to like how we categorize things in our lives and um <clears throat> you know some things are that's just part of life you don't necessarily need to be categorizing it as something specifically different uh just a follow-up question as a and then i know a dr satora will be joining us um so i uh, as, as you had mentioned previously, uh, you left Green School for about one year and then returned to UH uh, in Honolulu for about two years. Um, so why did you come back to Hawaii and what brought you back to Bali for the Green School for the past three years? Well, uh, my wife, Kaudi, is an early childhood educator. And of course, uh, as you know, in marriage or relationships, it's uh, one needs to negotiate, as we say at the Sparks Matsunaga Institute. And Kaudi was really missing her work. She's an excellent, talented teacher in Waldorf preschools and kindergartens. And we were both missing Hawaii a little bit too. And then one other thing that happened related to UH is I received a second uh, foreign language area studies fellowship. That's the FLAS fellowship. And that allowed me to study Asian studies and, and to do my my work with the Matsunaga Institute. But when I was offered another FLAS fellowship, I thought it was a good opportunity to take advantage of that and deepen my Indonesian language skills. And then uh, I also decided to study library science to go for a second master's. I was intrigued by some of that content, which maybe I can share more later about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely know about uh, negotiating, and uh, that's one of the beauties of life, you know, finding a partner, and, <laughs> and you never truly have everything kind of planned out, but, you know, things, there's always a journey, nonetheless, and a good adventure along the way. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Soro, it's had, worked out well for both of us. Wonderful. Uh, hey, Maya. Dr. Soro is uh -huh. with us tonight, so I will turn it over to Maya. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jose. Um, and thank you, Greg, for being here. And I, I appreciate your sharing these very practical and um, natural considerations when it comes to family and the decisions of where to build community and find place. I think that uh, as a part of the Careers and Peace Building series, such conversations and confessions illuminate that you know careers and peace building um, are not um, outside of the considerations of family and and um, 
And a lot of careers in peace building are in places that are destabilized when one has to um, consider that or places that are distant and different that allow for that bridge building. But it's so great that you did find this beautiful school there and community. And I wonder if you could tell us a little more about the work of the Green School, the mission, the students, uh, your colleagues campus. I consider this to be uh, an example of a peace building school in a number of ways, um, not the least of which is its holistic um, uh, value and um, its commitment to sustainability. But tell us more about uh, what makes it so special. Great, thanks, Maya. Well, one thing Jose commented on uh, the background, I'm currently sitting in our heart of school, which is in the middle of campus, which is a three-story bamboo structure. Uh, so we utilize bamboo architect architecture and uh, so it's quite a beautiful campus. This is one of the largest bamboo structures in the world that I'm, I'm sitting underneath. But regarding our community, there are about 40 countries represented in our student body. And so it's very international, but there's also a strong local presence. And I really appreciate that. Um, we have many faculty and staff who are from Bali and from Indonesia. I think currently over half of our high school faculty is there, Balinese. And we also have an excellent local scholars program, which is a way for local students from Bali to come to our school. We have an after, after school program for local Balinese students to learn English as well, which is essentially free for them. They, they can pay with recycled items. But I like that we're not just an international school on foreign soil in a jungle, uh, that we're, we're recognizing our host culture and, and appreciating our host culture and the host culture is very involved in co-creating what we do. But I, I love that international element as well. And again, as you said, there's, we try to balance environmental awareness with conscious action. Uh, I appreciate, for example, coming on campus, one, one never really sees a plastic bottle here. That's just sort of a, a consciousness that's carried by the community. And we could say that on other levels as well. Um, my classes are, as was mentioned, social studies, literacy, but there's a lot of freedom for the teachers. I also teach uh, physical education, well-being, classes like American football and yoga, and I do outdoor education and service learning. So surfing, uh, last week we had a service learning week where I joined two of my Balinese colleagues and about 10 students, and we, we toured uh, numerous temples in Bali. So there's a lot of creativity and trust for the teachers in, uh, in bringing a lively curriculum. Uh, I do a lot of co-teaching. I really like with my Balinese colleagues, their, their talents in the arts, we can bring that to social studies classes, for example. And uh, yeah, I love it. It's not a cookie cutter curriculum. There's a lot of creativity. It changes and adapts with the students and with the teachers and you know each year, the situation. But yeah, maybe just to end, it's, it's a very diverse community. I love that. It's culturally diverse. Academically, we're very diverse. We're not, we're not IB, but we get some very uh, high-end academic achievers who have, you know, goals in that regard. And we get many students who want other paths beyond college. And we're economically diverse too. So fun community to be a part of. And I'm really thankful to be here. It does sound super special. And I think that when you have a school that is connected to community, that invites the community in, but also brings the students out to the community, then the school does become a proper reflection of the community. And I think that's an important first step toward peace education, you know, to really think about an education that offers meaningful insight and inclusion you know, to and with the community and that uh, enables that bridge between um, classroom spaces and the world outside between you know, bringing the environment and nature in the way that you have the bamboo and giving um, the students a sense of a strong responsibility uh, for um, 
contributing to the community and, and bonding with it. So I think that, you know, that diversity is really special. I want to, I guess, ask at this point um, uh, how your time at the Matsunaga Institute at UH Manoa, kind of looking at uh, sustainability from this lens and education from this end, as well as peace building, you know, how has that informed some of your current classes as well as your overall professional ethos and commitment? Thanks, Maya. Good question. Before I forget, also, you weren't here for the first question, but I'm hoping we can find a little time for you to share a little bit about your connection to Indonesia and Bali later. So let's remember to do that. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I am sure many people in the audience don't know about that. And uh, I'm curious as well, just to hear your thoughts of why, why are you drawn to Indonesia and Bali? So we can come back to that. But when you talk about uh, the Institute and people and connections, uh, one of the first things I think about is the class I had with you, and that was uh, peace building for educators. But I remember there were so many quality connections I made in that class with other high school teachers. And we, we informed each other, we shared our curriculum. That was, that was really beneficial. But uh, there were other people I met, professors and students. One is Micah Fisher. I know he couldn't be here today, but Micah and I were in a negotiating class together. Um, he does incredible research around Indonesia. But I, he was in Indonesia and he came to Green School and shared his work with our students. And I know it was, was very well received, but you know, I don't think we can say enough about those connections. I think the other doors that were open for me, uh, really that grounding in Indonesian language that the University of Hawaii gave me through the FLAS fellowships. And uh, I'm so thankful that, for that because it's so appreciated by people in Indonesia. And uh, it's been good for my, my thinking as well. As we get older, I think there's some value in, in learning the language. Certainly some of my courses have been informed. I, I teach, uh, right now I'm teaching uh, Southeast Asian current events and modern history. I do Asian history, Indonesian history. I had a class on futurology or political futures at UH. I do a course similar to that here. But particularly from the Sparks Matsunaga Institute, negotiation, mediation, facilitation, I just think all of those practices inform not only my teaching, but um, my relationships with my colleagues. And as you pointed out, and I said early, even, even our personal relationships, uh, you know, relationships can, can be hard. They, they can have difficult times. And uh, just going back to some of those skills, I, I wished, you know, I had gained some of those skills before I was in my 40s. So I'm glad to bring some of those to, to students. Uh, I would like to share something very practical around facilitation in particular. I just think uh, as a teacher, I went through many years where I was often frustrated with meeting life. I felt sometimes I would leave meetings and just feel a little empty and grumpy. And uh, often in my experience, meetings uh, can be a little bit too much about business. You know, they're sort of like to-do lists. And uh, I like meetings that have a balance of also uh, talking about students or talking about each other or talking about curriculum. So uh, I've come to see meetings and facilitating meetings as they need a lot of preparation and sort of like the Trihita Karana, how do we go big picture and maybe have time to discuss curriculum or courses for next year or co-teaching. Uh, and then also regarding uh, the human to human contact, uh, something we've done here at Green School is uh, faculty share their biographies with each other. We can just take five minutes out of a meeting and take turns. One person can go each week. And something I've taken from Waldorf that I think is a great practice is just child study, child observation, where we might, we might all sort of hold and behold the student and not just how are they doing academically or how are they doing behaviorally, but really just observe objectively and lovingly and share our impressions of how are they be behaving, 
intellectually, emotionally, physically, are we seeing changes? How can we hold them and help them? So to make time in our meetings, not just for the business, which is important, and the to-do list, but also for uh, the human to human and the human to sort of the vision, the big picture. So I think facilitation really helped with that. And, uh, but I'm grateful for all of those modalities from the Institute. Thank you very much, Greg. And I, I think that um, it is not always apparent uh, that good facilitation is about much more than sort of careful minute to minute planning, you know, that it does require a measure of agility and practice and a learning to listen more deeply, which is something that we don't often give our students a chance to do. I've been realizing increasingly the value of deep listening. And that's a central component, of course, of negotiation, mediation and facilitation, all three. And this idea that in giving people a chance to listen carefully, they can begin to hear from their community um, about those matters of concern, of worry, of anxiety, as well as of hope and possibility. You know, they can begin to mine the stories of um, uh, each other's, you know, gifts and superpowers and strengths and, you know, help to support and buoy each other in community. And I think that that's such an astute observation and one that, you um, uh, one when when I see agendas uh, for conferences and stuff, I don't often see uh, space for for that. And and so thank you for pointing that out. Um, so you called um, your talk today building capacities for social renewal, um, and that of course is part of it. This idea of creating space uh, to renew our social bonds and connections. Do you have some other examples from your teaching which work towards this capacity building with students? Yes, I, I'll give a few. I think one that particularly comes to mind is uh, both with students in an international setting and with Balinese faculty, when we, it all starts with dialogue, but culturally we have different approaches to dialogue, I find. So I know you know this, Maya, but in Indonesia, Bali, Southeast Asia, people tend to be a bit more reserved. I, I think they are a bit better at active listening. They're, they're usually not the first to raise their hand. So a dynamic I know I've observed in the faculty meetings at my school is the, uh, the non-Indonesians are usually jumping in and sharing their perspectives and chat, chat, chatting. And we need, uh, as facilitators in that sense, to make room for silence. I know Indonesians are often much more comfortable with silence and kind of resting a moment. And so how to allow everyone a voice, how to remind students about uh, and adults about active listening, those are tricks. And sometimes in meetings, we, we don't always have to speak in large groups. Sometimes a trick can be putting people in smaller groups and reporting back and making sure that everyone gets two minutes in the small group, something like that. Uh, something I do, this is, I wanted to share this book. This was a gift from my brother in 1984. The author's name is Gregory Stock, PhD, which is ironic. That's when my brother gave it to me, but I, I don't have a PhD, have no plans to get one. This is a guy from UCLA, but I've leaned on this book for a long time as a humanities and social studies teacher. And students love this book. It has about 300 hypothetical questions. And I start in ninth grade with the book and it gives the students practice in dialogue, in speaking and listening. And I like that the questions are hypothetical. So it's not about coming with the fixed answer. It's about how more to live into questions how to hear other perspectives, how to disagree and uh, without taking it personally. But there's, with this book, there's no, there are no wrong answers. There's no censorship of answers. And uh, it's just good practice in dialogue. And um, just in case, I, I don't want people to think that I just spend all day living only into questions. I mean, there are things the students need to learn, but in, the social sciences are a bit different than math that we are dealing with perspectives, particularly in an international school. So 
but there are things we can know. A, a big thing I love in social studies, uh, we, we study maps and geography and map making, uh, even orienteering. But uh, I'm often amazed. I know teaching in Hawaii for so many years, many of my students didn't know that Hawaii was in Polynesia or they couldn't list which islands made up the Polynesian Triangle or where, where were Melanesia, Micronesia. Uh, and that's similar here in Southeast Asia. Sometimes the students don't know that. So that's my responsibility to ground them in that. So that can be a trick. But one other one, just to end, I think a big one when we talk about dialogue is language. And you know, I teach literacy and social studies, but in literacy, especially creative writing, we work a lot with how to use verbs and adjectives and living language rather than just fixed concepts or sort of tired idioms <laughs> that you know someone else created. How can we bring language to life? And I think in talking and debating social questions, yeah, there's, there's the given that we get through advertising or the mainstream media or just common language. And um, yeah, learning to go beyond that. So even in, in, well, in modern advertising, oftentimes they'll use polarity, you know, Coke, Pepsi, Burger King, McDonald's. But I sometimes find that even in schools, we, we set up debates and, uh, you know, if, if I were in the US, for example, Democrat, Republican, Around election time, I, I don't believe in showing both sides. I believe in showing infinite sides, or at least a dozen sides. So, you know, if we're talking about elections, we might also share the Libertarians or the Greens or the Natural Law Party or who knows what. I know uh, regarding peace, uh, for those of you in Hawaii, uh, questions around World War II and the U.S. and Japan, and with my wife being from Japan, I'm Fascinating at, fascinated at looking at that topic where it can often be just a Japanese perspective or an American perspective, uh, but we can also look at the perspective of the Indo-Chinese who were sort of on the receiving end of imperialist activities of, of both those nations. So we can go beyond uh, just the duality narratives. And uh, yeah, I do challenge the students in their writing and their dialogue to utilize living language. They'll often use terms that we throw out like liberal conservative, uh, left, right. I don't think those terms often mean so much anymore. Uh, so it's good to challenge ourselves and each other to speak in a more living, living way that characterizes rather than labels with, with fixed, um, fixed nouns. Yeah, maybe that's enough for that. I think that there's um, so much in what you're you're saying, and and there are uh, wonderful ways to incorporate that multi-layered perspective in the curriculum. You mentioned debating. We can do structured academic controversies, right? That um, have the students argue from one perspective and then do a flip and maybe share a poem, pulpit speech letter journal entry from a different perspective and then find the points of intersection or um, media matters activities that look at perspectives uh, from 10 different countries on any one uh, news story. And then there's what you're talking about in terms of you know bringing that diversity into the school culture and into uh, the processes and, and rituals of, of pedagogy, as well as the content. Um, now, a lot of this idea of new language uh, is reflected in the titles of some of your classes. And I also saw that you gave a spark talk to the community at Green School, which was entitled Information Ecology and Technosophy. So I'm curious, as you're talking about living language uh, and hybrid languages um, are of course, part of uh, that journey to be flexible in our, in our language. Can you tell us more about what information ecology and technosophy are, but also just about what the talk was about and, and um, 
why is uh, uh, why is your tendency to create uh, titles that um, are uh, futurist and intriguing, perhaps? Good question. Yeah, I, I think I just uh, one of the courses I've taught for many years is etymology, which is the origin of language. And for years, I've taught the students Greek and Latin roots, and that that can open doors to all sorts of new language. So, you know, if we're talking about technology versus technosophia, would be you know the study of technology versus the wisdom of tech, tech Technology. And you could say the same with eco, e ecology versus ecosophy. But to get to the talk, essentially, I think the word technology is uh, a challenge how it's being used today. Most people, when they say the word technology in education, are talking about digital technologies and they're talking about the last 20 years. And I am a bit concerned. I, I, I teach those technologies and I think I, I go pretty deeply into. Um, the digital realm, data protection, uh, research methods, and, and those things. But I am an advocate for 20,000 years of technology, or at least 10,000 years of technology. You know, we to be technologically wise, uh, we should practice the things we talk about in Bali, as well as our, our digital technologies. So I'm glad to be at a school where we are incorporating the arts. But I've often said as a teacher, you know, perhaps we should also list as a graduation requirement the ability to weave a basket. What does that do for our thinking and, and, and our soul or to frame a house or to save seeds and plant a garden? Uh, I don't think those are simple things and they are, uh, there's technological wisdom behind those. Uh, with some of my classes, I just like to get the students to think a little bit too. Uh, that is part of the creative process at Green School. There are some very original names of classes. We're encouraged as teachers to to come up with an original names. So when I say something like cognitive sovereignty and information ecology, uh, cognitive sovereignty relates to epistemology. How do we know what we know? And that's a fascinating question in the digital realm. I know. Uh, one of the reasons I reached out to Jose was just regarding um, some current events. And uh, I suggested, well, well, yeah, we, statements of solidarity, there are often, uh, there is, there's perhaps Western hegemonic bias in some of what we stand for. So I like to challenge that with my students and with all of us. And how can we be aware, you know, wh why are certain bits of news on our radar? and others not. So, for example, Ukraine, uh, I'm happy to support a statement of solidarity there, but we tend not to, uh, you know, support the places where maybe the U.S. is involved. And it was fascinating for me a few years ago when the, uh, in my home state, George Floyd was killed, and I'm, students stood with that, but this wasn't their fault or necessarily our fault, but in the media, there was little known about Bolivia. And there are other examples. I guess where UH led me to that and the Matsunaga Institute because I was looking at conflict areas of Southeast Asia and fascinated me why were certain certain historical events on our radar and others not. And uh, yeah, I think that's enough said about that. There's uh, uh, a film featuring Noam Chomsky that compares Cambodia with East Timor that looks at our media and uh even in the digital realm i think we can be aware of that and we can i try to live into those questions with my students so i hope that answered your question maya yeah absolutely thank you and of course i particularly like this notion of looking at technology with a very long lens because here in hawaii we have a lot of kanaka wisdom a lot of indigenous wisdom that can be applied in futurist ways that um require that we think about technology in a lively and multifaceted manner and and look at um valuable technologies that can be adapted and scaffolded for uh current and future purposes so i i love uh that um you are helping us to revisit that word 
and uh, see it in new ways. Um, so we have, I, I have um, uh, perhaps two brief questions and I wanna invite um, any folks in this room, but also anyone on our Facebook live to uh, submit questions in the chat. And uh, we welcome you from whether you're watching on, you know, ICP, Seeds of Peace, um, the University um, KTUH radio station or Matsunaga Institute, please also submit any questions you have uh, for Greg. Um, and you know, I know that there are people out here who are interested in social studies education, green education, uh, storytelling, uh, and so on. So please do ask. Okay, so Greg, I wanted to ask you about personal peace. Uh, for you as an educator, sometimes we are regarded as folks who give and nurture peace in others, but perhaps are not very good at self care and looking after ourselves. So I want to ask you outside of work, what are the things that keep you balanced and happy feed your soul and bring you personal peace. Thanks, Maya. Good question. And uh, before I answer, I'll just put out one more time. Let's remember later to give you a couple minutes to talk about Bali and Indonesia. But I'll just say quickly, uh, uh, my wife and I love the ocean. So surfing uh, keep us, keeps us very balanced. And uh, she is a very serious gamelan musician, but I get to listen to that music and I play some gamelan as well. I love that. We're both dog people. We don't currently have our own dog, but we have a group of dogs we visit around our community. So uh, dogs are great. People are great. Uh, we have a lot of friends here in Bali, both international and local. Uh, that's a great place to spend time. Um, I think for me that Trihita Karana philosophy is something I, I do strive to but by so that that's a way for me to keep perspective and try to maintain balance in my own life and it can be a good compass to let me know when i'm maybe focusing too much in one area so i do appreciate that uh, time in nature and nature observation i um, years ago at rudolf steiner college i studied uh gertian science and gertian observation and uh yeah it it sort of opened my eyes for new ways of, of being in nature and slowing down. So that helps. I love time in nature. Um, and speaking of, of Steiner, you know, I'm not a Waldorf teacher any longer, but I'm a big fan of, of Steiner's work as a philosopher, Very, a lot of practical idealism. So uh, study, study outside of what I'm teaching. Um, I find that uh, that path consumes a lot of my time and feeds me, nourishes me in a big way. Well, thank you. And I hope um, everyone in the audience uh, can think about different ways to engage in robust uh, self-nourishment, right? And when we think about what plagues us at this time, uh, resilience is our resistance to those things that are going wrong. And we need to, as peace builders, of course, remain sturdy of both body and spirit um, and mind I and community. <laughs> I want to ask you when it comes to peace building, um, when it comes to educating, um, do you have someone other than Steiner who functions as an inspirational figure or someone who informs your work and you admire? Yeah, maybe I'll uh, I'll start with essentially my ancestors. I'm very thankful for my grandparents who were dairy farmers on both sides, uh, huge families in Minnesota. And my parents who had six children, uh, these were all you know, very hardworking, but grounded people. Uh, and so I'm appreciate, very appreciative of the strength I gained from them. I often look to my students. I just think it's it's a very brave time to incarnate on our earth, and they 
they're very idealistic, but very practical. So, and I guess just truth seekers of any stripe, philosophers, journalists, people who ask better and better questions and, and force us to maybe question some of our assumptions. Uh, we were at school allowed to name a room or two for heroes of us when our high school fac faculty moved last year. So uh, I named one room, room in honor of Steiner and I named another room in honor of Dr. Vandana Shiva from India. I uh, really appreciate her initiatives around uh, seeds and agriculture and nourishment. I think she's a very brave person. I love when I need a little spark, <laughs> uh, I go and listen to some of her videos. She, she's. Uh, Can you uh, share her name once more? Yes, Vandana Shiva. The last uh -huh. name is S H I V A. She actually has come to UH a number of times to give talks, and uh, yeah, I think rather than saying any more, uh, just check out her videos and you'll appreciate uh, Dr. Shiva's work. Fantastic. She's been to Green School as well. Fantastic, thank and, you. Uh, um, and I, I, um, I love this notion of someone who is all about seeds and agriculture sharing right now, given that in Indonesia and in Hawaii, I think that there is a lot in the way of peace movement building that is taking place from farms and from the uh, restoration of that connection with land, growing our own food, thinking about uh, food in terms of its environmental as well as health ramifications and looking at uh, food inequity, food scarcity. And um, I think that uh, food is something that is going to be of increasing importance as we consider, you know, both what we consume and how we grow it. And uh, here in Hawaii, certainly there's been a lot uh, in the way of food sovereignty and food security work and kind of, of course, a lot of wonderful place-based education coming from the farms and the um, lo'i and the fish ponds, the taro patches. Well, you asked me about well, Indonesia, and I will say my father was Indonesian, so I came to Indonesia not out of uh, interest, but uh, through my mother's womb right into the heart of Jakarta. Um, I was <laughs> born in Jakarta um, and uh, raised there for much of my earliest uh, childhood until high school when I came to Hawaii. And the bridge was always there between Indonesia and Hawaii for me because uh, we would come to visit my grandparents and then my brother and who lived in Hawaii. And so I have fond memories of summer spent here and, and uh, other months and other seasons spent there. Um, but always with an awareness of other places across the Pacific that were equally nourishing and, and lovely. And I missed uh, Indonesia when in Hawaii and, and vice versa. I will say that what I take from Indonesia of greatest value is in fact peace building. There is uh, this concept in Indonesia of gotong royong, this all hands together, we work together. And I found that when <laughs> Uh, in Indonesia, people really did support one another in very physical ways, as well as emotional ways. There is that sort of village and extended family life, which is also true of Hawaii, at least in uh, earlier iterations and being revived, that sense of community and kinship where, wherein family is thought of very, very broadly and everyone uh, who is your elder is your auntie or your uncle. Um, and that was certainly the case for me as a child, um, as well as this notion of shared endeavor being really critically important uh, to uh, not just success, but survival. And so there are a lot of frontline community solutions, I think that come from Indonesia and from my uh, being raised in village spaces. My mother was someone who championed microfinance projects all over Indonesia, so including Bali, uh, Batik Bali and the Balinese cloth with the gold painting that was in one of her villages, but also wood carving and um, cobblers and um, hats, rice paddy hats, and kris, the sacred daggers, 
And so we would go to these villages and she would find family wherever we went. And there continues to be a really strong, robust community of people who remember her as, and uh, her work to set up cottage industry micro lending to enable particularly women to move forward and forge lives of um, greater independence and um, enable uh, these village industries to really form the backbone of the Indonesian economy. By the way, the aforementioned Micah Fisher is the first scholarship recipient of the scholarship in my mother's name, which is really see. And he is, of course, also part of our Matsunaga Institute family. The other thing that when I think of Indonesia is the syncretism, the religious uh, uh, flexibility and civility and respect and there is uh, in the Universitas Islam Indonesia, a Hindu temple that was found during excavation. And Micah was there when I saw it. And the rector was telling me that uh, they had to reroute the creation of their library uh, and extend that project two years or something in order to be stewards of that temple and now Hindu pilgrims come and see this temple inside the Islamic University. Of course, I grew up with uh, a world where Sultan Hamankubono was a Muslim in Yogyakarta, but would also give offerings to Nyai Lorokidul, the goddess of the South Seas. And the kris that uh, he carried was thought to contain a spirit. So there were lots of indigenous and animist and nature-based um, uh, spirituality that was very much a part of the world there. And so I think of that kind of flexibility to embrace the value and to um, have sustained dialogue with people of different perspectives and traditions is really Indonesia at its best. And, of, you know, um, and uh, so thank you for that question. And thank you uh, for uh, your bridge building between Indonesia and Hawaii and other places. Um, so there are a couple of questions here for you um, in the 10 minutes that remain. Um, Sue says, hi, Greg, would you mind sharing more about how conflict resolution is taught or applied at school? And how do the students think about it? Sure. Uh, Maya, just before I answer that, I wanted to thank you for your two examples. What, uh, you, you have an Indonesian audience uh, listening and uh, a lot of smiling and nodding on this end. So well said, thank you. Um, you gave two very critical examples, which I know come from experience, not just theoretical. Um, so great examples, thank you. And yeah, I guess I didn't share as much about how, for example, mediation and negotiation take place in teaching. So. Sue, I apologize if you came in for that. I, to be honest, uh, when I taught in Hawaii, I did more with mediation as a practice and taught it very similar to how it was taught at UH, where you know we we create some scenarios and people would would um, take on different roles. Uh, I have done less of that here, um, to be honest. Perhaps, yeah, I found it difficult with high school students and I found it a little easier to incorporate it into social studies discussions, you know, when coming out of even disagreements about what we might be studying. You know, I mean, the beautiful thing about Green School is we, we could be looking at the war in the Ukraine. I have students from Russia, students from Ukraine, students from all over the world. So we're often, massaging relationships, hearing varied perspectives, and uh, you know, living into questions and dialogue. So mediation and negotiation, as I said earlier, are almost more of a, a living practice. Um, and how to bring it to students as a curriculum, that's something I'm, I'm still living into. Uh, they do, our students do have a model United Nations. They're doing some of that um, in those groups too. But uh, like I said earlier, I, I do a bit more with facilitation 
and even having students creating agendas and then holding meetings, keeping to time frames, and trying to incorporate many voices, making sure people uh, stay involved. I hope that answered your question. So. Um, thank you, uh, Greg. And um, Yennefer asks, I'm curious to learn about how you define peace. Is her question to you? Wow. I think of it as a process. I don't know that it's a fixed state that we come to. I think uh, we all know maybe from personal experience, those moments of inner peace, calm, joy. And then we also know that maybe a half day later, something throws us off. So it's constantly a process, but I think that's true in our, in our families, maybe in, in a marriage or your relationship with your children, uh, at work in your relationship with colleagues and students, that uh, it's an ongoing process and it's challenging. And, uh, you know, I think, um, Paying attention to how we dialogue, uh, you know, respectful dialogue um, can go a long way, even if, if there is disagreement. Uh, that is something I do see in Indonesia and Southeast Asia that there, there's a lot of attention paid to how, how we dialogue. And it doesn't mean we don't disagree or have different approaches, but. Um, yeah, I guess the best way I can think of it is peace is more of a verb than it is a noun. And it's, whether it's inner peace or global peace, it's something to keep working toward and to keep striving for new insights and, and for new capacities. Well said, well, thank you. And I want to, um, as a final question, ask you to, you know, think about, um, the future. Uh, what is the future of education as you see it, of international education, of education in, in Asia, or, um, you know, kind of what do you think we are moving towards? What is important for us to pay attention to now as, um, as, as educators or just community members who are working to uplift, support, and, um, and love young people? Hmm. Wow, Maya, great question. Thank you. And, uh, these are challenging questions too, but I'll try to respond. Uh, I think part of it does relate to honoring our ancestors, honoring our collective global heritage. And I think one way to do that is to live into practicing, learning, honoring, living into 10,000 years of technology. Uh, you know, I think the the goal of education is to more deeply understand who we are as humans and to live into uh, live into our idealism and, and you know more hopeful futures. I think if we can give students capacities, um, what I do see about the arts is it brings confidence to to children. And uh, when they grow into being adults, whether they're learning a computer program or a new language, they can approach any learning hurdle with, with confidence. And, uh, and I think that's important. Uh, I think I've mentioned already, I'm a little concerned. I think we're quite enamored with the digital technologies. That doesn't, I am by no means uh, trashing those, but uh, I think sometimes we can have sort of a one dimensional focus and approach like that is our future answer. It does open many doors for communication like like this talk. So uh, I'm thankful for much of what it brings, but there are social justice and environmental justice questions that come with, with these devices as well. So I think it's a question of balance. Um, I think we can look at the opportunities they bring, but what other skills, what other capacities do, do young people need? And I think that's, if that's a leading question, that educators have and they take the time to discuss those kinds of questions and to discuss the children in front of them because they often are will reflect clearly what their needs are then i, I think we're on the way to to uh, 
renewal and education as well. Well, thank you so much for those insights and important thoughts. And I think you've given us a lot to ponder and uh, appreciate. And so I want to also Thank you, the audience, for being part of this conversation, for your questions. Thank you to Jose Barzola and also to Zephany. Um, and thank you to the Matsunaga Institute. To learn more about the Institute, do please visit uh, peaceinstitute.manoa.hawaii.edu. And this conversation will go live on social media and be published in long form via the Matsunaga Institute's YouTube page. So share the link. Uh, with those who might be interested and were not here today and also go out and create conversations around what you learned and heard here today and follow the Matsunaga Institute on Eventbrite to register for future events. Mahalo everyone, mahalo especially to you, Greg. Thanks to all of you too, thanks for coming. Maya, thank you for your kind insightful words about Indonesia. We'd love to get you to green school soon. So I love stay in to touch on that. Okay, you, you already have many new fans here. And Jose, thank you for the dialogue and the connection. It's really been nice to reconnect with you too. So aloha everybody. Aloha. Selamat jalan. <laughs> Yo, sampai ketemu lagi. Sampai jumpa lagi. Sampai jumpa.